Welcome to Top 40 Help Desk Interview Questions and Answers. This video is incredibly important because every time you apply for a help desk job, they expect you to know some of these very basic things that are simply required for you to do your job as a help desk person. This video will go on to cover the basic skills and we will also concentrate on Office 365 mainly because Office 365 nowadays is a requirement. So you got to have this knowledge. Now that part of it is in second half of this video. So be sure to watch the whole thing. I wish you best of luck and let's get into these super detailed interview questions and answers. I promise you I will show you in details everything. Can you tell me about yourself? Be very careful when answering this question because this is your first big chance to impress and you can do so by stating the facts related to this job. Only talk about previous experience, education and formal training related to this field. It is important to understand that follow-up questions may be related to anything you say at this point. So what I mean by this answer is that you want to talk about anything that relates to desktop support. So let's say you are interviewing for the first time for this type of position. You want to talk about your experience that relates to this job in any way possible. You, you can talk about hobbies and such and, you know, about yourself on a personal level as well. But as long as you can relate it to this job in some way, this is the most beneficial answer you can give. Question. You've received a trouble ticket that monitor is not working. What is the first thing you should do? A lot of times cables are not plugged in correctly. First, I would check power, then video signal cable, and if both check out, make sure the computer itself is powered on. If interviewer asks for further troubleshooting steps, I explain that there is a possibility that video driver or maybe the monitor itself is simply bad. So what I mean by this answer is that sometimes we have to go down to basics when it comes to resolving issues. And that's exactly what interviewing is trying to figure out when asking this type of question. So of course, there is a chance that cables are loose, which happens. There is a chance that video driver is bad, but that is super rare but it is something you might want to mention as a last resort. Although most of the time it's either a loose cable or the monitor is simply bad or going bad. Question number three. What is safe mode? How do you get to it? And what is it used for? In order to reach safe mode, computer must be restarted and by pressing the F8 key before the operating system loads, you will arrive at a selection screen at which you will scroll up and select safe mode. Safe mode is used to troubleshoot driver issues, hardware issues, and remove viruses or unwanted software. In Windows 10, the combination key is shift plus restart. So in this answer, uh, when it comes to older operating systems like Windows XP, uh, Windows 7, you would do it by pressing the F8 key when the operating system is booting. This will get you to a menu at which you can select a few different modes related to safe mode. One of them is safe mode. The other one is, for example, safe mode with networking. However, when it comes to Windows 10, it's a little bit different. While you're within Windows operating system, hold the shift key and select the restart button. This will put the computer in a maintenance mode at which point you can navigate to perform a safe mode boot. Question number four. What is an IP address and how to find it? IP address is a number assigned to your computer to identify its location on a network, meaning that DHCP server will assign a number to each computer connected to a network as part of identification. You can find your IP address by using a command prompt and type in ipconfig forward slash all. 
this will display full IP address with a lot more of useful information. Alternatively, you can, within operating system, look at the network adapter properties. So when it comes to this answer, IP address is something that each computer receives as soon as they connect to any type of network, whether it be physically or wirelessly. When it comes to DHCP server, essentially DHCP server can be a router, a switch, or a dedicated server that assigns these addresses to every computer that connects to this network. Question number five. What is a default gateway? You can see what the default gateway is by performing an IP config forward slash all command through the CMD. Default gateway serves as a path to reach other networks. For example, in order to reach the internet outside of your business or home, you need a gateway that will open the way for you. Default gateway in a business environment is typically a proxy server. So when it comes to default gateways, default gateway is always going to be your switch or a router. And this is when it comes to a simple home network or a simple business network. In a large business environment, it's going to be a proxy server because proxy server can monitor and filter any traffic that goes outside of your network. Question number six. What is Active Directory? Active Directory is a feature of Windows Server operating system and contains user accounts, objects, host names, group policies, and domain services. For example, Active Directory will have information about user login credentials. In addition, it can contain group policies that will apply different permissions to user accounts that belong to specific groups within same domain. So in the nutshell, Active Directory in a business type of environment has the information about your PC login. So let's say a user goes to a computer, a random computer that's within a business and tries to log into the computer, chances are they will be using the main login credentials which are configured within Active Directory. When it comes to group policy, group policies are created so that way instead of creating special permissions for individual users, user is simply added to the group policy that has these permissions already pre-configured and it applies it to that specific user. Question number seven. What is a domain? Domain is a group of computers and users created for a network in order to control access. With a domain, you have a group of systems that are bound by the rules of centralized authentication server. In a domain, each system has to connect through the domain server using provided credentials. A computer user will have domain login access once their credentials are created or added to that specific domain within Active Directory. For example, your job's PC login will most likely be a domain login. So let's put this in a simple real world explanation. If you got a brand new computer that you're trying to connect to the domain, first you have to get a host name from the domain controller itself. Once you get a host name, you would assign that host name to the computer, after which that computer, once added to the network, will have access to the domain resources. Same thing when it comes to adding a brand new user to the domain. So brand new user by default does not have a login or privilege to log into any computers that are controlled to by that domain controller. So this is why we have to create a new user credentials within the domain for that specific user, which will allow them to log into the computer. Question number eight. You receive a trouble ticket that states printer is not printing correctly. This issue is caused by a bad or wrong printer driver. Solution is to acquire and install a correct printer driver. To expand on this, this question, as you've noticed, specifically points out a weird pattern on paper and not necessarily 
a faded or you know broken up patterns when it comes to printing or anything like that so in this case it's very clear that ink is not an issue that there is plenty of ink so the only thing that can cause this and you've probably seen this example before where you send something to print let's say a document and it prints it out but the pattern on it is really weird and it doesn't make any sense this is a very clear case of a bad or wrong printer driver after which you have to simply reinstall it question number nine what are some commonly used LAN cables there are four different types of LAN cables commonly used cat5 cat5e cat6 and cat6a cat5 speeds are up to 100 megabits per second cat5e are up to 1000 megabits per second cat6 up to 1000 megabits certified gigabit and cat6 up to 10000 megabits per second all the speeds are based off 100 meters maximum distance so the key here is to just remember different types and different type speeds available when it comes to commonly used LAN cables. Not to say that there aren't other LAN cables, there certainly are. There are many different types, but these are some of the most commonly used ones. And what you will most likely see in an older type of business environment is CAT5, which is only up to 100 megabits per second. The newer businesses will most likely will have cat 5e which is up to 1000 megabits per second which brings it up to the gigabit speeds so if you need be just kind of make sure you remember all the different speeds so that way you can answer this properly question number 10 what is blue screen of death bsod Blue screen of death is most commonly caused by bad hardware. The error appears as a blue screen crashing the computer. Blue screen of death can be caused by hardware, software, or driver issues and conflicts. In order to troubleshoot blue screen of death, you will need to run a full hardware diagnostic on the PC and update all of the drivers. When it comes to blue screen of death, a lot of things can cause this. In my personal experience, hardware has been majority of the time the cause for blue screen of death. This can be caused by bad hard drive, bad video card, bad RAM. Sometimes it can be caused by software or a bad update on a computer. So make sure that everything's updated up to the current and also can be caused rarely by a virus so make sure that your antivirus is updated question number 11 what is dhcp dhcp stands for dynamic host configuration protocol and it deals with handling of ip addresses for all computers connected to a network each computer is allowed to have connection to the network or internet resources after the HCP server assigns an IP address dynamically. Dynamic type of IP addresses can change at any point. So what this means is that as soon as you connect a computer to the network, you know, you take the LAN cable and you plug it into the computer, the DHCP server can see it and says, oh, okay, there is a new computer connected to the network. I'm going to give it an IP address so that I know that it exists and also let it get basic access to the physical network. In this case, dynamic host configuration protocol assigns it dynamically. So what happens is if you unplug that computer and take it to somewhere else, and plug it in it will have a different IP address hence it's assigned dynamically it changes all the time question number 12 what is DNS DNS stands for domain name system and it reroutes known host names to IP address that hosts its service for example 
DNS for Microsoft.com is located at 104.90.84.14 IP address, but it can be changed randomly. You could say that it serves as an address book for the host names, which are then translated into IP numbers in order for computers to understand it. In this example, it assigns and routes web address names to the web hosting service. If Microsoft.com changes its IP address, that will be perfectly fine because the main name system will know that. Of course, you have to have a static IP address for this to work, so you don't want it to change all the time. However, for this web server, you just need to change, make changes to the settings that point to that IP address. So as soon as you change the IP address, you can go back in and say, okay, Microsoft.com is now at this new IP address, and this is what DNS does. Question number 13. What is VPN? A virtual private network is commonly used as a secure way to connect from remote location to network resources in your business or company. For example, you can take your laptop to a coffee shop, start a VPN or create a VPN, and through it securely connect to a PC at work or access companies emails and files. So let's say I do go to a coffee shop with my business laptop or work laptop. First thing that I would do once I connect to the Wi-Fi at that coffee shop I will start a program most likely that will create a virtual private network connection between that coffee shop and my workplace. This usually happens with conjunction of a token key. So what would happen is I would launch the software. It would ask me for my credentials plus the token key which is randomly generated. This creates a safe tunnel connection between two points. Question number 14. What is a ping command? The ping command is used to determine whether your computer can reach external or internal resources. For example, through command prompt, type ping followed by the name of the websites to test connection. This function sends four packets of data which are sent back as acknowledgement of successful connection. It also provides the latency results measured in a milliseconds. So in this example, you can use the ping command to test to see if there is a connection between your computer and the website, but it can be also used to test whether you can reach different resources on the same network, for example, another computer over the network. When it comes to testing connection between multiple points, a trace route command is used instead. Question number 15. What is a group policy? Active Directory assigns a group policy to each new user added into the database. For example, if you work in desktop support, your user login credentials and permissions will be assigned to a group policy. In Active Directory, you can take any user and place them into a group that has predetermined settings. Group policy can restrict read, write, or execute and restrict access to network resources. So in this example, you can basically just drop a new user into a group that already has predetermined settings. So instead of you having to go in and create a new user by itself and then assign different permissions to it that would either allow for example to read write execute or admin privileges you would simply take that new user and drop him into a group that has predetermined settings so let's say you do desktop support for this company once you do start working for them all they will do is create a login for you give you a login ID and that login ID will be in a group most likely called tech support. Question number 16. 
What is a .pst file? .pst file is a file extension used by Microsoft Outlook archives. An email archive would commonly be known as a PST. Every time a user creates an archive in Microsoft Outlook, it creates a PST file which is stored locally on the computer. So whenever the computer crashes, for example, and the hard drive goes bad, this file is destroyed as well because it is stored locally only. Not to be confused with an OST file, which is basically a cached version of your inbox that is also stored on an exchange server remotely. Question number 17. How would you change folder permissions? You can change folder permissions through group policy, but it can also be done at local level with administrator privileges. Under folder properties, select security tab and then edit after which a pop-up will provide an ability to add users and allow for read, write, execute, or full permissions. This type of thing is typically done with server storage where users are allowed to access certain parts of it. So let's say there is a server within your business that everybody has access to, but they only are allowed to do certain things to the folder and the files within it. This is where you would change folder permissions. Question number 18. What is the difference between a switch and a hub? There are a couple of main differences between switch and a hub. Hub can be used to connect multiple computers to a single network, while switch can be used to create multiple segments of the same network. Second difference is that with a hub, all computers connected share bandwidth which can create latency issues. Switch can regulate this by only sending data packets to computer that requested the data and is able to regulate the bandwidth. Interestingly enough, this question can trip up a lot of people. The main thing to kind of keep in mind is that Switch is a lot newer technology and it's better at handling a larger amount of computers, whether it comes to switching, data handling, or bandwidth. Question number 19. How would you recover data from virus-infected computer? In order to successfully and safely recover data, you would extract the hard drive from the infected computer. Afterwards, you would slave it to a second computer that has updated virus definitions, updated Microsoft patches and drivers, from there, you would scan the drive for viruses, and once virus is removed, you can extract the data that needs to be recovered. If at all possible, I would avoid recovering any data, but if it's 100% necessary, then you have to make sure that the slave drive does not contain any further viruses before you attempt to recover anything. Also, with a slave drive, you're not running the virus in the background whatsoever because you're not using that hard drive as the main operating system that you are currently using. So this is why it's slaved. It's not able to execute anything unless you intentionally go look for the virus on the slave drive and then run it. Otherwise, it's perfectly safe to scan that slave drive with antivirus software. How do you change user passwords? You can change user's password from Admin Center or Azure Active Directory. So the first way to change user's password is through Microsoft's Admin Center. Once there, select Users, select Active Users. You can search for users in the search box over here, or if you see them over here, you can simply select them. So in this case, we're going to click on Sally Mo, and then once that opens, you have an ability to select reset password under their name. If you select that, it gives you a few options and this is where you do it in Microsoft Admin Center. Alternatively, in Azure Active Directory, once you have it open, select users on the left. You can also search for the users in Active Directory or you can simply select them. So we're going to select Sally Mo here again. And then from here, we can reset the password by selecting the reset password above the user's name. 
And here we can also reset the password on the right. Can you recover deleted files? Yes, admins can do it using a OneDrive link or through SharePoint. For admins to assist user in recovering their deleted files, you can do it to Microsoft Admin Center. That's the first place. So if you go to Microsoft Admin Center, select users, select active users, search for the user or select them. In this case, we're going to keep using Sally Mo as an example. On the far right side or far right tab, select OneDrive. From here, we'll be able to create a link to gain access to their file. So if we select create link to files, it's going to create a link that we can select or copy paste into a any browser. And then we're going to select that. We're going to open it up. And here, what it looks like is the same thing as users OneDrive. So you're doing it on behalf of user. And then if they have any deleted files, there will be a recycle bin over here. Alternatively, you can restore users' files through SharePoint. However, I will explain this a little bit later in the video because there's another question that relates to that. So please keep watching. Can users recover their own files? Yes, through OneDrive Recycle Bin. We're going to keep using the same user and example. So Sally Mo accidentally deletes her files. She can certainly recover them through the OneDrive. So here's her OneDrive, and if she goes to Recycle Bin, she can recover any of these files that she accidentally or intentionally deleted. If she accidentally empties the Recycle Bin, the files are not permanently gone. She can still recover them by going to the second stage Recycle Bin, which is here. What happens to lost emails? You can check status of sent or received emails through Exchange Admin Center and performing a message trace. So sometimes users report emails missing, whether they've sent an email and the recipient hasn't received it or they have not received the email that customer was supposed to send it to them. So what happened to those? We can trace those by going to the Exchange Admin Center. On the left hand side, select Mail Flow and then select Message Trace. This will allow us to trace any messages that were being sent back or forth. To do that, select Start a Trace. We can select a sender, for example, Sally Mo. We're going to keep using her as an example. And then we're going to say recipients as in all to see if any, all, and then we're going to change the time range. We're going to leave it so we can see a, a instant access of the summary report. Select search. And here are the names that she sent. If we select one of them, we can see whether the email was received, processed, or delivered. If there is an error, it will show up similar to this where it says not delivered. This is an example of missing email. What is the difference between Office 365 Group and distribution? Office 365 Group creates group emails, shared workspace, files, and calendars. On the other hand, distribution list is just an email list. So if you go to Exchange Admin Center, under Recipients, select Groups. This will show you Microsoft 365 Groups by default. And to get an idea of what it does, if you were to create a new group, select Add Group, and then it will give you a description of what happens when you create Microsoft 365 Group. And then it tells you here, it says Group Email, Shared Workspace, Files, and Calendars. These are all things that are created when you create Microsoft 365 Group. Now, if you go to the distribution list, which is the next tab over, all this is is just an email list. All the people that belong to this email will get emails. So instead of sending emails to each individual person, you just send an email to this distribution list, which will distribute emails to everybody that is a member of this distribution list, aka email list. Where do you change user licenses? You can change licenses through Admin Center or Azure Active Directory. 
You can change users licenses through Microsoft Admin Center. If you select users, you can select active users. And again, you can search for user or simply select it. We're going to keep using Sally Mo as an example. We select Sally Mo and the third tab over is licenses and apps. Select that and from here you can assign a different license if you'd like. Once you're done, select save. You can do the same thing in Azure Active Directory. If you go to users, find Sally, open it up, and then on the left side, you can select licenses and then change licenses from here. Can you customize user licenses? Yes, you can customize licenses for each user. You can certainly customize any licenses. If you go to Microsoft Admin Center, select users, active users, select the user you want to make changes to. Third tab over, select licenses and apps. If you scroll down, you will see where it says apps. Expand that and from here you can make changes whether you want to add or remove certain aspect of that license. Click save changes once you're done. If you go to Active Directory, you can do the same thing. Here is the user, select licenses. You can already see which license is assigned. Select that and then from here you can do the same thing. You can turn on and off certain parts of that license. What is the difference between SharePoint and Teams? From admin point of view, SharePoint controls group sites and files access. While Teams Admin controls communication aspects of organization, i.e. from access to group chat to user device controls and settings. So specifically from point of view of an administrator, so users will not be able to see this. You're administrator and this is what you would see. Here's SharePoint Admin Center. And here we can see sites, we can see active sites, we can control different aspects of it when it comes to activity permissions and policies and we can change any of these things related to sites remember whenever you create a SharePoint you create a site that users can use to collaborate and do things that are team based of course there are policies you can change sharing and access control as well in Microsoft Teams Admin Center you can control different communication aspects for example if you go to Teams Manage Teams you can see which group chat that they're using or their channel if you will and you can create new ones this and that you can also change settings like devices their control their IP phones and everything else that relates to communications can you have multiple different admins in Office 365 Yes, you can have multiple admins and can also have dedicated administration roles. It's a really good idea to have multiple administrators when it comes to Office 365, simply because there are a lot of things that are in there that need to be administered. You can make any user administrator if you really wanted to. This is also called roles. If you go to Microsoft Admin Center and find the user that you want to upgrade to administrator or change their role as it's known, once you have them selected and open, you can see under roles that you can manage roles. In this case, Sally Mo is an exchange administrator and billing administrator. We can add more roles to her or remove all of them together if we really wanted to or specific ones. So in this case, let's remove exchange administrator and just make her teams administrator. And then we're going to click save changes. And now she can be a teams administrator. Very simple. How would you add a shared mailbox? Shared mailbox is created in Exchange Admin by creating individual mailboxes or by creating an Office 365 group. Users can add the mailbox in Outlook by Add Shared Folder setting. Shared mailboxes are created inside of Exchange Admin Center. Once you are there, select Recipients, Mailboxes and then add a shared mailbox. So select that. Once you create a shared mailbox, you can add members to it. These are all people who are allowed to use and access this mailbox. You can add users from here. You can select the ones that you see from here or you can simply search for them and then add them. So for example, let's just add a couple of these users. 
And once this is created, there's also an alternate way to keep in mind that mailbox are already created, and that is through groups. So underneath the recipients, instead of selecting mailbox, select groups. And then if you create a Microsoft 365 group, it automatically creates a mailbox for that group. So keep that in mind. Now, don't forget users need to go to Outlook to add the shared mailbox. And that is done by adding a shared folder. This is how users can now access shared mailboxes. What does error message you're missing out mean? The error means that user does not have access or license to that specific part of Office 365. Here's an example of this error. You're missing out. Ask your admin to enable Microsoft Teams in this case. And it tells you right away that this person does not have access to Teams. So if we go back to the Microsoft Admin Center for this person and then go to Apps, extend this, make sure that Microsoft Teams is now selected. This grants access to this user, save changes. And if we go back and hit select refresh here, there we go. Now she has access to Teams. So anytime you see that message, that means that they don't have access to that specific part of Office 365. What happens to reported email messages? To report an email message, you would do so through Exchange Admin, after which it's sent to security and compliance for a review. So every time you report a message, which is done through Exchange Admin Center, if you go in here and, for example, do a message trace, we're going to start a quick message trace here. So that way we can report an email. Once we get an email that we can report, we simply select report message. This is then sent to research and compliance and it takes us there right away where we can report the issue. For example, if it's phishing, malware or spam. So this is where you would do it. And this is what happens to it afterwards. Whoever is working security and compliance part of Office 365 will go through and review these reports. Can you have multiple group owners? Yes, you can have multiple group owners. This can be changed in Azure Active Directory or Exchange Admin Center. So this is an important question because yes, you can have multiple owners. This wasn't the case before from what I remember. I even have it in one of my videos where I couldn't do it. It wouldn't let me have more than one owner, but apparently you can do it now. So I'm not sure what changed, but the answer is yes, you can have multiple owners. For example, here we are in exchange. If we go to groups, so these are Microsoft 365 groups, just for an example, and we select finance group, we can go in and go to members here and then view all and manage owners. We can see that Sally is the owner here, right? And then we can add pretty much anybody else we want. So let's pick Bob here. We're going to add and now we're going we have two owners. See these are owners and they're all underneath here. Same thing kind of happens in Teams, which again wasn't the case before. So the actual answer is yes. Uh, while again, I tried it before in my other videos and it wasn't working. So let's go to Tim's policy here or no matter of fact, actually, let's go to manage teams so we're going to change the team owner inside of microsoft teams admin center and you can already see that i already have bob already is applied on there since we made the change in the admin center we can see that bob is already an owner but then we can go in here and automatically add let's say larry here to be an owner as well and you can see that it actually works so the answer is yes what is rank in group policy? If you have a new group policy and wish for it to overwrite other previous policy, you just need to rank the new policy with higher number. This is done in Teams Admin Center. So this question 
actually refers to something that's within Microsoft Teams Admin Center. If you go to Teams and then select Teams Policies, you can see that there are three different policies in here. Now, the next tab over next to it is Group Policy Assignment. This tab over here is basically shows you which group is assigned which group policy to it and which ever takes the precedent the meaning that whoever has the higher rank will override any rules under the lower rank so let's see what happens when we click add group we're going to select which group we're going to apply a policy to so we're going to apply it to in this case let's see what happens actual finance group so this is a finance group we're going to apply a policy to it and then we're going to rank it meaning that if we select a um, if you select here you can see the description of it but if we change this number to higher than other ranks meaning other below policies then this rank will overwrite any policies that are lower or underneath it so we're going to select that policy and we're going to apply let's for example pick this one here and this policy here selected since it ranks higher it will overwrite any other policies that this group has applied to it so we're going to click apply so now we see that actual finance group is going to rank higher when managing devices what settings can you control you can control anything from date time format to network settings this is another question related to Microsoft Teams. In this case, it's talking about devices inside of Teams. So devices in Teams are basically phones, display bars, and different electronics. For example, if you go to IP phones, select all the way to the right configuration profiles, and then select add, you can see different things that you can change when it comes to creating custom settings. And this is exactly what it looks like when it comes to a phone. You can change date, time format, display settings, if you will, and of course, network settings. Same goes for these other devices. Which computer platforms are supported by Office 365? Microsoft Windows OS, Android, Mac OS, and iOS. Both the Admin Center and Azure AD can access users. What is the difference? Admin Center allows for quick and basic user access control, while Azure Active Directory provides additional and more technical control of user profiles. I feel like the answer to this is self-explanatory, but I digress. Let's look how a user looks like inside of Admin Center. Once you have them selected, these are the options you have. You can change some account settings, you can change devices, licenses and apps, mail settings, and then OneDrive settings. Here is the same user in Active Directory. We can have changes to, we can do changes to roles, administrative units, groups, applications, licenses, devices, authentication methods, signing logs, audit logs, few more other things that don't exist in Admin Center. If Recycle Bin is not visible, is there another way to access it? Yes, you can access it through SharePoint. Then select More Features, then select User Profile, then select Manage User Profiles, search for User, select Manage Personal Site, and then select Recycle Bin. So this used to be done in OneDrive Admin Center. This is no longer the case. Now it's done through SharePoint Admin Center and for which you have to go down and select more features and then you will see on the right it says user profiles select open and once this open we're going to select manage user profiles then we're going to search for user use a drop down arrow here and then select manage personal site now we can select a recycle bin, which is located right here. This gives us direct access to user profile, meaning OneDrive. So we are inside of users recycle bin. We can select any of these files and then select restore, which is directly restored 
into their OneDrive. Can you send emails from a shared mailbox? Yes, however, user needs to be allowed to send as an Exchange Administrator. So yes, users can send from shared mailboxes. And this is done by composing a new message or creating a new message, if you will. You have to make sure that from tab is enabled, select on from, and then choose the shared mailbox you want to send from. However, we have to make sure that in Microsoft Exchange Admin Center, user is allowed to send from. So let's take a look at that. And here we are in Exchange Admin Center. We're going to select recipients, mailboxes. Check the mailbox that we've just selected to make sure that the user can send from. And this is done by selecting the mailbox and then under mailbox permissions here, select mailbox delegation. And then we can say send as edit. And then we can see that Sally is indeed listed in there, including Mike and Bob. All of these people can send as and from that mailbox. If they're not in here, it's not going to work. Can users become admins? Yes, you can change any licenses or delegate team administration for their group. This is something we touched on earlier. Yes, users can become administrator. Let's pick a random one here in Microsoft Admin Center. We're going to select manage roles. In this example, Bob, I'm sorry, Larry does not have any administrator access. If we select manage roles here, we can give them administrator access. So we're going to select admin. So instead of user, no admin, we're going to select admin center access. And then we can make them whatever we want. In this case, we're just going to make them a help desk admin, save changes. And these are options of what kind of admins you can change them to. There are more, but this is an example of what you can see within Microsoft 365 Admin Center. Why should we hire you? This is your last chance to sell yourself to this employer. Mention all of the qualifications related to this job, all of the work experience, all of the education and certifications that you may have. Don't forget to smile, make eye contact, and confidently explain why all these things would make you a perfect candidate. In addition to this video, I just wanted to mention how it is very important to your research about the company you're applying with. This will further prepare you and increase your chances in getting this awesome job. Thank you so much for watching. I wish you best of luck in your interviewing. If you need assistance with specific job roles like help desk, system administration, network administration, guess what? Guys, I have videos for those too. I will put a link to the playlist on the top right hand corner if you want to check them out. And also, if you got a moment, please leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you got hired. How did your interview go? And if you got time, please click the like button. If you wish to support the channel, you can also join my channel, but none of that is necessary. I just want you guys to succeed in life. That makes me more happy than anything else. So again, I wish you best of luck and you have a wonderful day.